Good morning, everyone. It's Saturday, which means it's time for yet another Salty Saturday morning. I am your host, Mr. Kadish. Get it right. That is my name. And I know that there's a lot of really breaking news happening today, but we're not going to talk about any of that stuff. We're going to talk about what I want to talk about. <laughs> I'm producing this show. God damn it. Master Pumbaa. Speaking of, speaking of producing the show, let me introduce my fantastic panel of nerds. Starting with Matt Vader, 74. How are you doing, buddy? I'm good. I don't want to talk about any of this stuff, so I'm going to go. <laughs> gonna go start your own stream i'm gonna go play hell divers you can find me over on my oh, channel i play, play hell divers <laughs> you what what man so you're gonna go start your own stream with hookers and blackjack hookers oh, blackjack and and uh yeah and caffeine blow <laughs> let's go caffeine blow. So, speaking yeah. of caffeine and blow brian from the popcast is here i both caffeine buddy? and blow come on <laughs> yeah get it <laughs> You are the best blower I think I've ever met. That's correct, and I use hundred dollar bills. I was going to say I think we need to remind him what that means. Yeah, I know it. I know <laughs> he what it is our means. clear representation. I know what he it means. I know co- what both of them mean. Yes, Brian is our queer shield against everything woke and cancel culture. So thank you for being here, of course, Mr. Mr. Latinx uh, LGBTQIA plus <laughs> minus divided by sign. <laughs> you are more than welcome. More than welcome, and. The Lord of the Shelf, the master of the pineapple on the pizza himself, Odin from OMB Reviews. How you doing, buddy? Ah, I'm getting getting tired of the pineapple jokes. How's your best friend uh, Vivek Ramaswamy doing? Oh, we haven't had him on since, so uh, <laughs> would, wouldn't know, but I, I'm doing okay. I'm more frustrated because uh, Facebook sucks. Uh, my mom's account got hacked, and there's nothing she can do to oh, get no. it back. And the only ways, like, the only things that are even being suggested are things that for, for someone like her her age just just goes over her head so trying to help her through a distance because she's in louisiana and i'm in tennessee it's just uh it's been a fun 24 hours let me tell you i told you she needs to send in a blood sample and her government id and she'll be (laughs) fine you know speaking of jokes that have been run into the ground odin i noticed your shelf has a friend what's going on with that back there oh there's a second shelf oh my god there's a new shelf that show's been there. What are you talking about? It? Well, I don't yeah. pay attention that much. So They're breeding. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> They're multiplying. And Tom Connors Jr. from Midnight's Edge, the man who was on every live stream, so why not ours? How you doing, buddy? I'm not on everyone. Robert never has me on. Yeah, he's been on my show. Tom's never been on mine either. <laughs> he's he's like, we're going to get you on. We're going like, <laughs> to get on. I I'm jealous that. right now. And so yeah. you have your flashlight with you today? <laughs> What does it smell like? Dude, clean that up. Gross. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it, it smells like sand. <laughs> it's everywhere, it's you know. It gets yeah, everywhere, I, yeah. yeah. There's like Everything smells like sand. There's something in the bottom, like you need instructions, I guess. It's how to clean it, yeah. Oh, a warning, how to clean. Use water and vinegar only. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to get one of those for myself. Only <laughs> really, does it really say to only use water and vinegar? Oh. Has anyone looked on eBay and see how much they're going for yet? I did. Yeah, like 50, 60 bucks. Ain't yeah, it? too rich for my blood. There's some, I want one. some places, but not every place. I might Speaking have to buy one. Too rich for my blood. Robert Meyer Burnett is joining us. Well, hello. <laughs> my blood doing, is Robert? not rich. It's polluted. <laughs> Uh, no, well, it's good to be here. Always always fun to come, uh, come, to, come to be a salty nerd. Polluted with the blood of the younglings. Yeah, or the, the, the blood of Shai Halud. <laughs> actually well, that's uh, the water of but uh yeah for, for those of you guys who are wondering about the thumbnail so originally we had zach scheduled to be our special guest on the panel today unfortunately he has pneumonia and uh, can barely talk that's um, not an so, excuse yes yeah. indeed but uh robert was yeah, robert to, and i would be here yes come in at the last minute to fill in at least for our first uh topic of the day which we will get to in a moment you said the magic uh, words brah I know, right? I, I was like, ooh. I'm, I'm like, hey, Mr. Kadish has, has ensorcelled me with his with his dulcet tones and the two words I can't resist. Exactly. Star Trek. Star Trek. <laughs> All right. Just want to give a big shout out to everyone in the chat right now. We got Penny, Danny's mom. We got Studio Lau. We got Mephisto's Movie Reviews. Good to see you, Mephisto. We got Wendy Hunter. Always Wendy Hunter. Thank you for being here today, Wendy. We got Trivia Queen herself, Anima Confusa, in the chat. Anima. And of course, Anthony Mark, who's struggling with his uh, rainy New York weather today. And uh, let's see here. Who else do we got? We got Chase Hedges 67. 
all you guys, thank you so much for being here with us today. We're going to get a move on. And I also see Zax is in the, uh, in the chat. So I uh, hope you feel better, buddy. Uh, but until then, uh, I want to give a big shout out to Scotty Dub, who is our top contributor, our top super chatter. $100 that he super chatted us. Really appreciate that. And our most consistent super chatter, Mexican Iron Man. Good to see you there. And of course, By the way, I got... missed his birthday this week. Yeah, this it was. Shout shame. out to Mexican Iron Man. Yes, one year younger, from what I understand. Uh, He's so not even got, really uh... Mexican, but we'll tell that story later. <laughs> We've got uh, Jillian N, W G, Sam Schwager, Major Chai Chai, and Eric Winberg, who are our top gifters right now. Uh, for those of you out there who are interested in, uh, you know throwing some swag our way, feel free to drop some gifted memberships in the chat so people can check out our fantastic members only content out there. Uh, want to give a, yes, fantastic. Want to let everyone know that our goal for this live stream is 10 new memberships. So whether you sign up for yourself or you gift memberships to other people, we're trying to get 10 of those throughout the course of these next two hours. And also don't forget to give us a rating, five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. We're trying to get as many of those as we can so that Rotten Tomatoes can't reject our application to be accredited movie reviewers. It's never going to happen, bro. It's never going to happen. Why would Doesn't you want such a try. horrible thing? Uh, for fun. Especially as you, you fail to giggle. post any reviews on Critic Lists. I was yeah. just going to say, did you know what I did this week? <laughs> yeah. Oh, he will tell you. Yes, he did. He signed up and he started what? posting reviews. Good job, awesome. man. It was awesome. Good job. Okay, so Criticless now allows you to embed YouTube reviews. Mm, which is your awesome. Reviews, which is great. Good stuff. And also, guys, if you haven't already signed up for sign up, up for our Discord, there, uh, you can uh, go there and uh, chat with the rest of the uh, Salty Justice Warriors that we have going on there. And uh, instructions are linked in the description to link your YouTube account with Discord. So if you get a gifted membership or you sign up as a member, you get instant access to the members-only sections of the Discord where we do all types of fun stuff over there. And speaking of fun stuff, Matt Vader 74 I don't know if you know this or not, mm. but yesterday we published our very first movie commentary over on our Patreon store so that people can go oh. and download our running commentary oh, of Masters goodness. of the Universe from 1987. That How was did you a, not have me involved? That was a fantastic uh, movie. We Man, only had so many uh, spaces Tom, in our studio. Today. Tom, he doesn't listen to me. I, I tell him, I go, you should bring Tom in. And he and Matt's all you like, no, listen to Matt forget, more forget that guy. He's, he doesn't know what he's talking about. We don't Matt, Matt was like, here. who's Tom again? <laughs> <laughs> who's this now? No, if you what guys does he to, know about He-Man? If you guys go to saltynerdclub.com, you can go to our Patreon page. And check out our store link, and there you can actually buy the uh, ability to watch the the commentary for just ten dollars, nine ninety nine technically. Hmm. Um, but uh, if you go there, like you'll see uh, uh, all four of the salty nerd people struggling, struggle bussing through this uh, canon classic. So uh, be sure to check it's that an out. Amazing if you movie. Get a chance. It's a uh, it's a movie. That's that's for sure. There's <laughs> Dolph Lundgren in it. Yes, it, it does have Dolph Lundgren in it. Don't yeah. make me rage quit already. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So enough of the housekeeping. Let's get to our first topic of the day, which is one I'm very excited to talk about because there's going to be some fireworks here. And that is, is Star Trek a completely dead franchise? Now, we have multiple Star Trek experts on this panel, but I want to go to Brian from the podcast first because they built their YouTube empire off of the backs of Star Trek. And they have seen firsthand how the, audi the audience, the fan base, has completely become apathetic to this once beloved franchise to the point where nobody cares anymore. No. And if you notice, we are, we've stopped making Star Trek videos for that reason. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't just because I, you know, because people stopped watching it, but because I also stopped caring. And I remember talking to Shane, and I think we were making, like, our movie rank Star Trek list. And I'm, like, halfway through the editing. I'm on, like, day two. And I'm like, you know what? Shane, I don't want to do this. Like, I'm tired of doing this. He's like, what? Like, YouTube? I'm like, no, no. I'm tired of making videos about Star Trek. Like, I feel like we're at the bottom of the barrel now. We're talking, we're literally talking about, we're making a list about our favorite Star Trek from the past. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is where... 
this is this 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 is meant to be the last Star Trek video until we're actually excited about it again. And he pretty much agreed. He's like, I thought I was pretty much only doing it because I thought you wanted to keep doing it. I'm like, I don't want to keep doing it. And uh, the next video after that was, uh, I believe it was a Willy Wonka video. That also performed poorly, but at least I had fun doing it. So um, we've completely changed our our channel uh, strategy to focus purely on uh, basically documentaries. So histories of. Because Star Trek um, was dying, you know, and if there was a star, if there was Stargate news, a Firefly news, then you know we would do, we would keep doing videos like that if there was out there. But Star Trek, we we don't care about Star Trek. The new Star Trek sucks. The the news is always a bummer. Um, Stargate is in you know what seems like permanent limbo. It's not exactly, but we can't talk about anything that's not already fact. And Firefly is effectively just dead aside from conventions so the stuff that we built our channel on is just either completely dead or mismanaged to the point where no one everyone's apathetic about it so our entire our empire as you call it which is not empire it's like a little hill it's more um, of an empire it's a fempire uh you know we we put a video out and you think if you have a hundred and thirty thousand subs you know that video will at least reach like a 10 percent watch especially if it's your, your major fan base so when you put that video out and it's all about Star Trek and it's 30 minutes of, of glorious Star Trek and it gets like 4,000 views, that's the writings on the wall. It's time. It's time to move. And we're doing histories now. And our next history that's coming out this next week that I'm working on now is going to be awesome. And Shane's been working on it for the last like three or four months, the writing stuff. So yeah, we had to change our strategy because people are so apathetic. And, and I honestly yeah. stopped caring. Like honestly, dude, the last season of Strange New Worlds started off fine and then just sort of like continued to drag me into the the realm of completely not caring star wars did the same thing where i just i no longer care you know when you pop your google feed on like the first few few uh news stories on your google feed is usually something you care about well it used to always be star trek for me mm -hmm. but google's algorithm got smart when i never clicked on anything and now it's like now it's showing me you know uh superman news or whatever um because because I just don't care. And, and most of the articles are like, they're trying to celebrate something that is already dead. Like, oh, check out this last season of Discovery. Sonico Martin Green says it's going to be, I don't care. I don't care. Yeah, but that's this the time game, they're going to fix it, Brian. This, the, no, it's it's going to be a roller coaster. They're more episodic. I don't care. You've already lost me. You, you've already <laughs> lost me. And there's nothing you can do. I'm sorry. I'm, like, we're done. I've never seen more people celebrate something like the end of a show than they are about season five of Star Trek Discovery. It's like, this is the last season, guys. Yeah. Hooray. Yeah. Shoot the fireworks up in the sky. They're it's done. over. Let's get finally, out of here. It's finally oh, over. Our no, misery is over. And you know what's nuts? And you know what's nuts about this is you look at the trailer and with all of their their grandstanding about how it's how it's episodic and action adventure and they listen to fans. The last like ten seconds of the trailer is just like D E I D E I D E I D E I D E I discovery. Yeah. All right. All right. Well. Should yeah. have just been Star Trek D E I. Right. So, yeah. Star Trek D yeah. discovery. I don't know, man. Yeah. It's Instead just... of S T D, it's D E I. Yeah. yeah. Star Trek D E I. Yeah, I had that on a thumbnail like a couple weeks ago, and uh, I realized that like discovery fits great into the D E I uh, well, letter it's landscape. Well, it's the D I E. That's well, yeah. you, you know, Brian, so this leads to a larger issue where basically we've had nothing but bad seasons of Star Trek for like the longest time. We had one respite with Picard season three, but that was the third season of a very bad show. And all the hype, all the excitement that that show generated was squandered by Paramount and Kurtzman. And yep. basically, it's very clear that Star Trek legacy is not going to be happening at this point. And you know, after so many complaints, not not just about the writing, but also about like all the forced uh, diversity and uh, inclusion stuff that, you know, Star Trek has been championing uh, on all this stuff, uh, you know, making the Klingons like Trump supporters and like, uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, like all this other like weird stuff that that got super political uh, and subversive within Star Trek. And basically, if you complained about it, the sh not only the actors on the show, but and the makers of the show, but also a certain section of the fan base accused you of being racist, sexist, homophobic, yeah. you know, transphobic, like all this other stuff. 
and all we wanted was just a good Star Trek show. And we that finally was just get, me. Yeah, we finally, <laughs> we finally get a good Star Trek show, and they do nothing with it. They just they do the nothing. Ball. And you know what's crazy, Matt, is they have the numbers. Like you know that you know they can see how many people watched that, tweeted about it, posted about it. They can see the the outpouring of love for Picard season three. Like they know exactly what they need to do if they want to keep their fan base happy. Like they know. There is no way that they haven't had discussions about, well, what do we do about this legacy thing? Every every Liz, Star Trek legacy thing, everyone wants it. They know. They have the numbers. They have the it's you know what's crazy is in the back in the day when it was Nielsen raising rate ratings, you know, there was a little bit of amb- ambiguity there because um you know, DVD sales and rentals after the fact, rewatches, recordings, it was very hard to track that. But now with streaming, you know exactly who signed up and who watched and how many times and when and all that. So they have all the information they, they, they need to write the ship and they have the the jumping board to do it. And they've actively decided to not do any of that and continue with plans that are only going to hurt the franchise. So at this point, like, I, I would like to say, oh, well, it's incompetence, right? But at this point, when you have that much information, it can no longer be incompetence. It must be selfishness or maliciousness. That's well, it. Al- also, like, the, the true death of a franchise is apathy, right? Like, if you have passionate fans who are negative about stuff, like, that can be just as beneficial as passionate fans who are positive. But if people just don't care, they're mm. not going to be tuning in to rage about it or, or praise it. They're just not not going to care if it dies. And that's what uh, the point where I want to bring Robert into this conversation. You know, Robert, uh, what's your take on, like, do you truly believe that Star Trek has basically committed seppuku, seppuku and killed itself uh, through uh, fan apathy? Or do you think that, you know, um, with the Section 31 movie and like all this other stuff they have planned, could there be like a resurgence in interest in it? Well, first of all, that's shooting. The Section 31 movie is being made right now. I think the worst thing about Star Trek is it's become irrelevant. Mm-hmm. And the, the 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 real problem with Star Trek is it is no longer compelling television. Right. And what people forget about the original series that they they Star Trek was actually a very thought provoking show, in addition to being an action adventure allegorical science fiction take that could Uh, address social issues under the cloak of science fiction adventure at the time when network standards and practices wouldn't let you deal with a lot of those situations. The, the show Star Trek now has nothing to say. It's an amalgamation of ideas from other places that aren't in depth. They're not, I mean, at the time Star Trek was written in, and let, let me just be clear. People are saying, what's your favorite Star Trek show? If you want to look at the evolution of a genre, there is one Star Trek show. There's the original three-season series. That is the template for what Star Trek is. Now, it might not be your favorite. I understand that because it's of a different time. But if you look at what Star Trek is, you can't look at any other Star Trek. You have to go back and look at the basic tenets of what was contained in that original show. And what made it so groundbreaking was just how smart and thought-provoking it was, especially for the time in which it was made. So you would think that the Star Trek that we're getting today should be an extrapolation of what Star Trek in the 60s was, meaning it, it should be, we have so many more things in our world that you could use as fodder for a, a speculative science fiction show that could be mind-blowing whether we're addressing the future of AI, whether we're addressing transhumanism, being able to alter our bodies, alter our consciousness. I mean, they're doing none of that. They're they're going back, and even the characters, there's cliche Star Trek ways of talking to people or talking to one another, like and, and like the conversations Saru or Michael Burnham might have are these weird, these are the converse, these are Star Trek conversations. They've got the the idea right, but they don't have the substance right. They're all these really dumb conversations pull, full of like these faux emotional platitudes. Yep. And people mm-hmm. think that that's what Star Trek is because no one – here's the thing. The people that are making Star Trek now, they've never sat down and watched it. 
They've never sat down. They can't get past the production of it. They, they, they look at the effects. Star Trek had groundbreaking effects for its time. Mm -hmm. And you might laugh at the when they beam down to planets, the planet sets just have different colored backgrounds. But you have to understand, you have to look at things in their context. Now, there's a reason why they haven't made, they can't make it, they can't figure out how to make another Star Trek movie. They couldn't figure out how to make Star Trek Beyond. Hell, they couldn't figure out how to make Star Trek Into Darkness. I mean, you look at a movie like Dune 2, which is in theaters right now, less than $200 million it cost. It's truly epic in scope because you have everybody that worked on that movie at the top of their game. Into Darkness cost more than that movie did. And that was more than a decade ago. And that movie's god awful. I mean, if you look at it, it's, it's, it's just inane. And the problem with Star Trek is since 2017, remember, it is a Discovery is a bastardized version of what Brian Fuller wanted to do. He was kicked off the show, just like David Goyer, Goyer was kicked off the foundation, basically because it was a lot more expensive up front than they thought it was going to be. They didn't realize that, oh, we're making a show where the budget, we have to spend a lot of money up front because we have to build everything from scratch. And then we amortize the budget and you incorporate that through the rest of the show. And Star Trek was expensive, but it used to be 26 episodes. Now an episodic Star Trek show that was only 13, or in the case of the first season, 15, it's going to be more expensive. But really, it's become irrelevant because no one is telling stories that have any revel re relevance. The only relevance that they have today is they're trying to make it inclusive, which for Star Trek is pretty stupid because it already was inclusive over 50 yeah. years ago. And the inclusion that they're making now is so pandering and so anti-imaginative. When you're dealing with a civilization, when humanity is marrying aliens, do you think anyone's going to care about your pronouns? Do you think we're going to have a problem with someone's sexuality or their belief systems? I mean, it's so reductive. Star Trek should be the most thought-provoking, most insane science fiction on television right now. People should have their minds blown in every episode by the concepts. All we're watching is regurgitated, warmed over, inane uh, filterations of ideas that were interesting over 50 years ago. It is a terrible, terrible, terrible show that lets down the legacy of Star Trek, and it's made by people that aren't smart. And they're giving us something that is, it's the worst kind of comfort food. Start, it's like, oh, Strange New Worlds is like the original series. Well, maybe in its structure, but it doesn't resemble the original series at all. You're watching the dumbed down second grade version of Star Trek with Strange New Worlds. It's for little kids to make them feel good about themselves. And in a world where, where adults are so infantilized, people look at Star Trek, the Strange New Worlds, and go, wow, it's a show that's literally based on how handsome the main lead actor is. That's it. That's all it's got. It has not one idea in it that is original or worth sharing. It is such a bastardization of what Star Trek could and should be. And the reason that it's dead as a genre is it is completely irrelevant to the modern age. It has nothing to say to any of us about anything. And even there, they got Michelle Yeoh, so they're going to make a Section 31 movie. They destroyed the whole idea of what Section 31 was. They watched Deep Space Nine. Let's face it, they didn't really watch Deep Space Nine. No. Somebody heard the idea of Section 31 and said, oh, it's like the Star Trek CIA. No, it wasn't. Then they made it like, let's give, give everybody black uniforms and, and, and membership cards, and everyone knows where their base is and where their ships are. And, they didn't have a base. They didn't have ships. Or did they? We didn't know. That was the whole point. I mean, I, I've, oh, I'm sorry. Got me on a Saturday morning rant. I'm, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> hey, Rob. Uh, clear. Rob, real, I'm sorry. Real quick. You know, uh, people always uh, uh, bring out Fuller as an example of what it could have been. But didn't Fuller start the DEI process? Wasn't he one of yes. the? Yeah. Yes. But here's the thing. If you look at things like his Hannibal show, I think Hannibal is one of the finest examples of horror on television ever done, and it's full of DEI, but 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 I think done correctly. I mean, there's no reason not to tell stories and incorporate 
different kinds of thought processes or different kinds of people in shows. But in science fiction, it allows you to do it in an interesting way. I mean, they ruined the trill. The trill were, or I mean, the yeah, trill literally are a trans alien race mm -hmm. where the trill are different genders throughout their lifespan. They literally are. They're right there. And they already dealt with episodes beginning with the host in Next Generation when, when the Trill were introduced over 30 years ago, where where Beverly Crusher falls in love with a Trill. A Trill is a joined species where an alien symbiote is inside mm -hmm. a humanoid. And, and Beverly Crusher is having a, a love affair with one. And through what happens in an episode, he dies. And his symbiote is moved into the body of a woman. And she can't hang with that and they have a great conversation where the woman the new version of her lover says look i'm the same person i'm the same person that i always was yeah and it's she's really like an episode she's like i i just i can't i can't go there which by the way is the exact message that we need today yeah because now there's sides. all there's all yeah there's all this forced inclusion or you know people criticize there's an episode called the outcast the fourth season fourth season Four season where there is a race of genderless aliens, and some a very small percentage of these genderless aliens sometimes uh, uh, feel either masculine or feminine. And Riker rolls into this planet and falls in love with one that's feeling a little bit more feminine, and and they have this love affair going against everything that her society or their society says. And at the end, she has to undergo conversion therapy. And they turn her back into somebody who's genderless. It's actually a horrifying end of the episode. And it speaks way more to what's going on in our civilization now than the, the ridiculous. The difference is people want to see themselves reflected. Oh, look, that's me. But is it really you? Is it you today? Or is it the you you think you might be in the 24th century? Because and, and that's Rob, what's really important. Rob, I, I want to hop in here. Um, Please, so sorry. I know that uh, a lot of the blame of this, both on the movie side and the TV side, lies squarely with um, with Kirkman, right? Kirkman, and Tom yeah. Tom brought this up like you know er, a little bit earlier. So I want to throw it to Tom. Tom, tell us what role Kurt Kurtzman had in basically running Star Trek into the ground. Um. Well, there's one piece that I can't quite get the answer to, and maybe someday Robert will be able to get this from Brian or. What have you? I even tried to ask him certain questions and I did get certain answers um, because, you know, on the surface, it looks like Kurtzman has this vendetta against Fuller because uh, he come in and took Star Trek from him, screwed up Clarice so he couldn't have Clarice and Hannibal, you know, so there's there's this track record. And but, by the way, that was also terrible. Yeah, it was. Well, which is funny because that's the one time the media actually went after Kurtzman was when he destroyed Clarice. They didn't care about Star Trek, but they sure did care about Clarice. But from my understanding, is like Fuller was was ousted, um, and then uh, was it Gretchen Berg and that other guy? Yeah, ran Harberts. things for a little bit. Harberts, yeah, for a little bit. And then that's when Kurtzman came in. And the part that doesn't make any sense to me is that Moonves supposedly got rid of Fuller because the show was costing too much or going to cost too much. And then you bring in Kurtzman, and they're literally spending almost ten million dollars an episode. But see, and this is where I wonder if Kurtzman didn't bring the Netflix deal with him or something, because that's where the money got injected into the show. And that's where I'm trying to figure that part out. But yeah, he came in, rewrote everything. Um, you know, uh, a few of us on this panel have seen uh, early versions of the scripts written by Fuller and, uh, and Nicholas, Nicholas Meyer. Meyer. And that's the thing is, uh, when I interviewed Nicholas Meyer, I asked him flat out, I'm like, what in the show is yours? And he said, well... It's a conglomeration about a lot of things. And then when you read this, it's like nothing. That's why he couldn't answer it. Cause there's nothing in the show that he wrote, right? They just used his name and that was it. Um, and frankly, it's just Kurtzman and, and, and Brian, it, it, Brian and Robert hit it the nail on the head. And, you know, we were one of the first people to report this 25% different deal. And they kept denying and denying and denying until recent years where they've actually had to admit it. And then it's by this point, nobody cares. Like, that's the problem. But as far as Kurtzman goes, like he sees himself as the emperor of Star Trek now, and he's going to continue to. In fact, I mean, there's rumors that he might even buy the franchise out completely uh, because uh, his secret hideout has a stake in it now. And that's why things are so convoluted. But yeah, I mean, we all heard the rumors that he was upset about, 
Picard and all that kind of stuff. But go ahead, Matt. So, so mean? Kurtzman, who's destroying the, the 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 franchise, literally driving its value into the dirt. You're saying is going to buy it? Isn't that's that, one of the rumors? I mean, that. <laughs> that's, I mean, well, I, the only reason talk that's about a, talk about a way to 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 make something valueless so you can like. Pick my it up understanding is it's just because he's bought into the franchise now through Secret Hideout. And if they sell the company or merge with another company, that's going to complicate Star Trek. So they're looking at either buying him out or him buying Star Trek altogether uh, for secret hideout. Crazy. You know, uh, so speaking of that, I want to throw this to Odin. Uh, so Odin, there's been a lot of rumors lately about uh, Paramount's precarious financial situation. And there's talks about Paramount either getting bought outright by another studio or sold off for parts. And part of that is, is selling off, the Star Trek rights to try to, you know, um, basically get some cash flow going. What's your take on the health of, of Paramount and CBS and these entities, which basically own the franchise and what kind of damage could a, a sale do to it? It's kind of hard to quantify just because, because I know that when it comes to the streaming side of things, it's, it's definitely not one of the better performers there. I think that there's just inherent issues with the actual, um, with the actual system that they use with the actual app. I know that there's been a lot of people that have had, you know, various types of issues. But then when I look at like, for instance, like the box office, you know, it did not, uh, you know, clearly did not have very, a very good year, at least last year. Uh, they had films like Transformer Rise of the Beast, Dungeons and Dragons um, that, that were associated with them. And I know that obviously when it comes to Kills of the Flower Moon, there was a connection with Apple TV there. And so the financials are a little bit uh, less, uh, less clear. But I, then I also go back just a couple of years ago. Um, it's crazy to think how much time has gone by to back when they did a film like Top Gun Maverick, where, you know, obviously, you know, hugely successful movie. And so it's hard to see it because on the one side, on the film side of things, they are not the worst performing of the studios. Um, you know, that that definitely goes to places like Disney, for instance. And it's interesting that now there's mainstream articles talking about how Disney lost a billion dollars. It's like we've been talking about that for for a while now. Um, it's like, gl gl welcome to the party, pal. And so yeah. I I looked at that, but then I also looked right. at Paramount. And so because I don't follow the streaming side nearly as much, I don't really know exactly how much of of that side is costing or is losing. But it seems based on everything that we're hearing and everything that's being talked about right now that it's not going too well for them. And especially you look back to the Star Trek films and uh, you know, I, I went back to those numbers and I don't think any of them, um, any of the, the newer ones that came out made any money. Um, at least None of them initially, did. at least yeah, initially in their box office runs did not make any money with the last one losing, I think well over a hundred million dollars. So it's, yeah, it's, it's not a good state for it to be in. And, um, but it's one of those weird things because, you know, I think about Disney and I think about how much you know money they have, but also how much money they're losing so much more than anyone else. And yet I don't really see them moving as much. So I don't know exactly what Paramount might do, but you know, because they're not as maybe as, as high of a yield as far as they don't have parks or like, they don't have as many like alternative means of making revenue as a company like Disney would like this giant mega corporation, you know, maybe it might be a smart idea for them to start selling off some assets and things like that. Aren't, aren't Paramount plus supposed to be, isn't there a rumor that it might be merging with, was it Peacock that or was, something like it that? Was HBO, it was Max, right? It's but Max. Max. Okay. And that's, yeah. And you're, you're hundred percent right. They are in really bad shape right now. Mm -hmm. It's their own fault. It's because of Sherry Redstone splitting the company up, then trying to remerge it. They have not been able to do anything with any of their franchises, uh, despite having one big hit in Top Gun. Mission Impossible failed. Mm -hmm. Ninja Turtles failed. Um, Star Trek outside of Picard has had nothing but failure. Uh, they have assets, right? They've got IPs to work with. They just don't know what to do with them. Uh, and they get the wrong people involved every time. Even Transformers, something they license is falling off a cliff fast. Mm -hmm. So they have nothing bringing in any money. Paramount Plus is, well, I mean, all the streaming services are failures. Yeah. Let's be real. Yeah. They're yeah. learning it finally, like you just said before. Ex like, except Netflix. Well, yeah, but Netflix was the gold standard to begin yeah. with. That's the whole yeah. point. And this is where Andre was brilliant in his observation of, because look, I'm just like everybody else. I'm not one for a monopoly, and I think competition is always a good thing. But the studios and all of us, looked at Netflix the wrong way. We should have looked at Netflix like the format, right? It's it's not the store, it's the format, like DVD was, because that's all they did was basically start a brand new format war, but instead of us having to choose between one or the other, 
we had five or six different studios we had to choose from now. So if you mm-hmm. wanted to see something that Warner owned, you have to have HBO Max. If you want, that's to really astute. Disney. Did you guys do a, a, yeah. a, a editorial video about this? No, but he brought it up one time, and we brought it up a few times ever since, and that's exactly what happened because at the time Netflix and Hulu in the U.S. at least had the market cornered when it came to movies. It was Netflix, television, Hulu. Right? You knew you could see everything the next day on Hulu pretty much, and Netflix. You wait long enough, and every movie was going to be on there eventually, or they would make their way on there through the cycle. But then as soon as, like you said, everybody started coming up with their own things, you had to have that proprietary system to go. And it would get more confusing when you had shit like Yellowstone because mm-hmm. Paramount owned it, but the dumb shits went and licensed it out to That's to right. Universal. Yep. So if you wanted to see the new stuff, you had to have Peacock. <laughs> but if you wanted to see the old stuff, you had Paramount Plus So or, or the newer other spinoffs, right? Yeah. So it was compl- I had a lot of people confused going, but I have Paramount Plus. Why can't I watch Yellowstone? Yeah, because they, like, they, well, they would watch Plus. the spinoffs and say, this was amazing. Wait, this is from the universe of Yellowstone. I want to see that. Wait, what do you mean it's not on this service? That I just exactly. And well, here we are back with beta VHS again. Yeah. I so, think uh, one I, of the. I, oh. I finish your thought, Robert. Well, I just wanted to. One of the problems that I think has happened is the people that are calling the shots in Hollywood know less about the business of Hollywood than they ever have before. And you, you don't have because they're. They're controlled more by the analytics and and larger like companies like BlackRock and Vanguard who are calling the shots for most companies these days. The 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 desire to create the kinds of profits that they're hoping or expecting from entertainment companies are not the kinds of profits that those companies have ever delivered. And so everyone's floundering around trying to look for this miraculous payday and they've forgotten the core tenets of their business. So I think that's happening across the board. And what people jumped into about streaming was this, oh, it's a license to print money without understanding that they're like, oh, Netflix makes this much money for their subscriber base. Yes, with a bunch of programming they've built over a decade, they've done a very good job of licensing foreign content. Where's all the international content on these other streaming services? There isn't any. So they're never going to get a squid game or they're never going to get you know, hits of these French mystery shows or things from the Netherlands or from Scandinavia. And they don't know how to do what's going on there. And Mm -hmm. they're floundering. I mean, Disney Plus started, but you could get through what you wanted to watch on Disney Plus in a couple of months and then you're done. So, so, and, and and then they wanted to put their, their movies like Pixar movies on Disney Plus and not release them theatrically. A decent theatrical release with, a a proper marketing budget adds value to a movie. So when it finally makes it to a streaming service, people like, Oh, seeing reds finally on, on, um, on, on Disney plus. So now we can watch it. It, it, Now that's, that would make videos that much more like when Mm -hmm. you would go work at the video store, they would have that right on the ad Mm -hmm. theatrical release, even if it was only in theaters for a half weekend. And And I I, want to, I want to throw this to to Vader real quick because, you know, (laughs) coming at, coming at star Trek, from a fan's perspective, uh-huh. Vader, you know, one of your all-time favorite movies is Star Trek II. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, you were a big Star Trek fan. And now, how do you feel about the franchise? And do you think you're uh, representative of other fans? Of it? Uh, well, you know, as far as people like me, I still love my old school Star Trek. I, I still watch it on reruns and stuff like it. But, but I don't touch... Any of the Kurtzman era stuff. I just I'm not interested in watching any of that stuff. It's just it's not fun. It's not it, it doesn't scratch that itch. But you know, I can still go back and watch Wrath of Khan. I could watch that I could watch that movie on a weekly basis, probably if if I really wanted to. You know, it it it, it touches a, a special nerve for me. And uh um but there's just nothing about this this new stuff that I like. You know, it's like I would be more interested if they took uh, if we got the adventures of of uh, Captain Pike's hairpiece. You, you know, that would be way more interesting to me than than what what they're making these days. And now they're making title, you know, uh, Section Thirty One movie. And you know, I think we're getting are we getting a, a Starfleet Academy thing with uh, Tilly? Is is that still going forward? I don't know about I, Tilly, I, but I mean, you, you, yeah. you know, it's just that makes no, sense. nobody cares about this stuff. So I don't understand why they go forward with making them so no this stuff does not resonate with me matt and i but i still like my old spock and kirk and next generation era stuff sure um 
you, you know, but I'm an old guy, you know, that's and, and this new generation. I don't really think a lot of people even care or watch about that stuff, you know, it's, and it's, 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 it's a sad state. It's a sad, sad state that all of our entertainment from our old IPs are in the same, same boat. Apathy is what the word is that you said. Right. And that's how mm-hmm. I feel about a lot of this stuff. And, um, it sucks. And it makes me sad. So, well, what? I, I, I want to end this by throwing it back to Robert, uh, um, real quick, you know, Robert, uh, Star Trek has had such resilience over time. And it was because of the, the love of the fan base for this stuff. And going forward, all the new Star Trek stuff, like the fans just don't care about. And, mm-hmm. and Paramount and uh, Viacom and all, all these companies have tried their best to squash fan particip- like fan fiction, fan films, all this stuff that, that kept Star Trek alive in, in, the, in the lean years where like there was no new Star Trek coming out, right? And it, it just feels like like this is a franchise that's in its death knells. Like they can't even get a fourth movie going. Mm-hmm. Um, and, well, they've and, tried. And I, yeah, and yeah, and you maybe. actually have 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 some insight into that. So Robert, I, I want to hear uh, final thoughts on on this topic before we move on to to the next one. Like, can Star Trek be saved? I don't think so, and and only because it's I don't think necessarily it's Star Trek that's the problem. It's our society. That's the problem. Our our civilization, especially here in America, to love Star Trek is to love the possibilities of what humanity can become. It was always an optimistic vision of the future. And the fans of it were able to look beyond themselves and look toward what the future might be for all of us. Our civilization is not so much interested in that anymore, as it, especially young people, as it is about looking at me, 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 me. And so when I was a kid, I thought Star Trek represented, when I started watching when I was five, six, seven, I'm like, I want to go live in that future. Mm-hmm. I want to be friends with Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. I want to meet people like that. I want to have a friend like Scotty that can fix anything in the middle of a situation, life or death. We don't have that anymore. Nobody's interested. Look, as much as I love the internet, I love being able to talk with you guys and meet people. I like Tom, I've never known before, and I can watch people's work and admire that. I'm still bringing that Star Trek ethos into my own life, into my middle age and death. But nowadays, that's gone from our civilization. And Star Trek was a, was created at a time in the wake of the assassination of John F. Kennedy before we landed on the moon where there was incredible optimism in certain quarters, certainly in academia. You know, we're in the middle of the civil rights era where people were marching, you know, and people understood what America could be. Now people think that America is this horrible racist place and college campuses have become this bastion of wanting to destroy Western civilization. Yep. We have the Voting Rights Act. We have the civil rights era. All those people that were living through the Jim Crow South rose up and changed America. And now we're living in a place where people think that capitalism and Western civilization needs to be torn down. And they're stupid enough to believe that it's going to be replaced with some utopian whatever. Mm -hmm. Back then, when it was really happening, when there was real change that was being affected, whether it was Martin Luther King or Malcolm X, whatever side of that divide you came down on, these were people that were really affecting change in real life. We live in a utopian civilization, comparatively speaking, compared to what was going on back then. And everyone's angry and mean, and everyone thinks that, oh, the world's a terrible, horrible place, where we live in a time when let's allow people to walk into Apple stores and steal whatever the hell they want. Mm-hmm. I mean, our civilization has gone, it's completely inverted. And, and Star Trek has no place right now. And what we're getting is a weird Frankenstein version. So until our civilization changes, Star Trek is dead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very soft uh, generation. Very, very good way to in, in the segment. In the very so, least, uh, it's twenty five percent different. Let's say <laughs> <laughs> people right, don't like guys, to be uncomfortable we, these days. That's that's uh, a sad fact. We got some super chats to get to real quick. Uh, so doomed, huh? For two dollars, is there really no hope for legacy panel? It's dead. Yeah, it's dead. I gave up. I gave up even hoping. 
mean, there, by the way, there ne- to be clear, there never was a legacy. There was never plans for a legacy. It was never going to happen, ever. Yeah, I there mean, was hope. I, I think, that, yeah, there was that, hope that it could, but it, there was never any plans for it. Yeah, there was never any because you have to remember that Picard season three was abandoned by Alex Kurtzman and Akiva Goldsman. Kiva Goldsman went to do Strange New Worlds. Kurtzman went to make a sequel to The Man Who Fell to Earth. So they needed somebody. They're like, well, somebody will take this over. And Terry Metalis, who had a real love for Star Trek, was working on season two. He said, I'll do it. And he came in and he was able to, he didn't get everything he wanted, but he was able to take limited time and and limited budget and and make the card season. How dare the studios give fans what they actually are asking for? (laughs) I know, right? Uh, Gavin Blackburn for one pound 49 pence. Super sticker. Thank you, Gavin Blackburn. All right, we got some members chats real quick. Shorty Short, member for six months. Thank you, Shorty. My Uber woke daughter loves OG Trek. I think uh, one of the issues uh, right now is that the Uber woke. Like they like what Trek's doing, but they don't tune in. They don't watch, mm-hmm. right? So like you just get these, you get this forced stuff on the re- regular fans who don't want it, and so they tune out too. So that's the generation because all they want is the clips. All they want is the instant gratification, and so they want that two minute clip of them giving this great speech, but they won't watch the whole episode. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Gavin Blackburn, member for eleven months. Star Trek died in two thousand and five. Sadly, at this point, yeah. Yeah. And uh, then we got SFX F314 Sabretooth Raptor. That's a great name. For three months. The biggest mistake in Star Trek history is not getting to do the Romulan War. Kodo would have gotten to do it. Can't be saved until a complete shift. Yeah. Would take a miracle. Well, and that's just it. Apathy set in. And I can't believe because, like, I don't know what you guys have heard, but I mean, nobody was interested in anything other than Picard after Picard. And. Terry moved on to other things. And like you said, Kurtzman didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, I don't understand what's going on over there because <laughs> it's like they're actively working against their fans. They, yeah, it's, they, they what, hate money. What yeah. has, what, what has Terry moved on to? Does he have a project that's been announced? Or I don't remember exactly what it was, but I think he's working on something now, but uh, I know one, but I'm not Amazon sure or something like that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure. If, yeah. Star know. Trek Picard did well for Terry. Yeah. 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 Did. They did well for Star Trek. That's the thing. That's the best they had had since Enterprise. I mean, people forget that that Picard basically had the same ratings that canceled Enterprise. <laughs> oh, without less moon views. Uh, late night at without Cap- less move views, yeah. podcast. Uh, JT Gun for two dollars. Robert is one hundred percent correct. He usually is. You Pretty know, normal. Yep. <laughs> I'll, I'll, let me say I'm 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 seventy five percent correct. <laughs> I'll, I'll give, give you some more credit. 95, 95. I'll, I'll compromise. No, but I mean, I get leaked stuff now all the time, and we don't do videos on it. Yeah, same. Because nobody watches them. Don't yeah. care. They nope. don't care. Like, I mean, I'm hearing yeah. rumors like Nicole Kidman's going to be involved in something or other Star trek and I, I don't know how accurate that is, but, like, there's all kinds of stuff that keeps coming at me, but it's like, sorry, nobody cares. And I get yelled at for making Dune spoilers. <laughs> uh, you spoil well, I have a 70 year old story. Um, I, know, right? I don't think you could really. I mean, this is the third adaptation of Dune that we've seen. And the book's been around that's since on you if you don't know by now. Exactly. Yeah, that's on you. I, it's, it's I'm like, spoilers. wow, man. I mean, I read that book when I was 11. <laughs> yeah, I was making a post just yesterday on, Twi- on, on, on Twitch. Will you guys please quit talking about Dune too and what happens at the end? But then I thought about it and I pushed delete because I'll tell you what happens at the (laughs) end is not what you expect if you know anything about Dune. That's my biggest complaint Uh, about the movie. Otherwise, it's a cinematic achievement. But yeah, it's just only thing spoiled. Well, 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 you guys, you guys know, um, pretty much everyone on the panel gave me a hard time talking about Star Trek for our opening segment today because they're like, nobody watches that show. All of our videos fail when we, when we make them. Why are you <laughs> leading off uh, this? But like, I, I thought it was interesting that, you know, this is a textbook example of how apathy, like like turning your, your fans from any type of passion to just like not caring affects a beloved franchise. So real quick, I want to give a huge shout out to Samuel, Samuel Schwager, Schwager for gifting five Salty Nerd podcast memberships. Awesome. Thank you so much, Samuel. Uh, for those of you guys who got those memberships, be sure to check out the members content uh, playlist on our channel. Uh, we do two members live streams every month on the first uh, Tuesday of the month and the, the third Tuesday of the month. And then uh, in those uh, other two weeks, you guys get specific videos 
just for you. We're going to be doing our Dune Part 2 spoiler-filled review just for members. So uh, be sure to check that out if you get a chance. Uh, Rob, are you able to join us for our next discussion about Rings of Power, or do you have to go? Oh, no, I, I can hang out. Yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. What's All right, guys, so, Rings so, of Power? Yeah, so, so going from one uh, franchise that no one cares about to another franchise no one cares about, <laughs> uh, we're going to be talking about the Rings of Power and how basically before season two has even come out. I'm going to go uh, play with my it, Dune bucket. Yeah, Amazon ba basically signed a new deal with the, the two showrunners who are doing the show, and they've begun early work on season three, even though Amazon hasn't technically ordered a season three yet. But we all know that the show was guaranteed five seasons. Like when it first yeah, I mean, they have, to, they have to do this. Right. Yeah. They don't have a choice. And uh, by the way, guys, links to all the articles uh, in the description of, of this uh, live stream, if you guys want to check this out for yourself. But basically, uh, Patrick McKay and J.D. Payne have signed a new three-year deal, uh, which also uh, launches their own production company. You would think that they would have their own production company before uh, they launched uh, this series, but no, like they just started it, uh, I guess, this year. Um, so this article from The Hollywood Reporter, which really likes to suck Amazon's D, um, basically says that the show stands as Amazon's most watched original series and ranked in Nielsen's streaming top four every week during its initial run. Um, but also in The Hollywood Reporter, it, this is an older story where it talks about how uh, when season one wrapped, the show was less uh, defining than hoped, falling short of being the breakout hit that Amazon had envisioned. Uh, sources confirmed that The Rings of Power had a 37% domestic completion rate. Uh, customers who actually watched the entire series. Most people fell off after the fourth episode, apparently. And overseas, it reached 45%. Um, a 50% completion rate would be a solid but not spectacular result, according to insiders. Uh, the show has not been a major awards contender, either overlooked by the major guilds with the exception of sag Afro nomination for a stunt ensemble. But according to Jennifer Sulky, uh, she basically says, everyone's telling me the show's a success, so it's a success, despite uh, the actual numbers. Telling, uh, telling us otherwise. And uh, this uh, new news about J.D. Payne and stuff like that, um, uh, get the, the two showrunners, uh, Patrick McKay and J.D. Payne, getting a, a renewed contract overall deal with Amazon. If you go back to this article, which is uh, basically the, uh, kind of a promo piece for uh, before season one came out and they're talking about season two and all this other stuff, um, they're basically framing all the negative feedback they're getting as review bombing, right? And, and toxic <laughs> fans. Um, and it, it just, it really, really says a lot about, you know, the confidence that these guys have in the show. Because in this article, they basically reveal that the only reason these two guys got the gig, uh, because like they, they, they were uh, in the bad robot incubator, right? They'd, they'd gotten a lot of false starts. They'd never got anything off the ground. Kurtzman and Orsi, um, before they broke up, were like their mentors. And so like these guys are basically from the school of, of Alex Kurtzman in terms of like writing and, and Hollywood stuff. Of course they and, are. And, and the only reason they got the Amazon gig was because they begged J.J. Um, uh, Abrams to call Amazon and put in a good word for, for them. And so Jennifer Sulky being the, the star effort that she is, once she heard from JJ Abrams, she's like, okay, these are the guys that we're, we're going forward with. And, uh, but what, what's really crazy to me, like there, there's a point in this article where they're talking about the fans of Lord of the Rings. And I was just, I was shocked that this was actually in the article because um, basically, so, Right here, it says Tolkien's world has a long, unfortunate history of attracting fascist adjacent admirers, something that, something that would surely have repulsed the fantasy world's anti-totalitarian author whose Rings trilogy was inspired by the horrors of World War I. And then they talk about how Amazon, when they premiered uh, the, Lord, the first season of Rings of Power, basically turned off the ability for people to review it on Amazon uh, for like five, no, it was actually like eight days <laughs> and basically the, the company continued to monitor the reviews after they turned them on and would actively delete bad reviews. And this is all in, in this article, by the way. And then Amazon uh, claims that there's been a coordinated effort to attack the show for daring to diversify Tolkien with strong female characters and people of color. The hardest part 
was for people on the cast to have had things related to them privately that are just harmful, uh, said one of the executives. Okay, and then uh, when, when when they're talking to Alexander Payne, who, who's like, uh, you know, uh, one half of the show running crew, uh, he basically said, it's very hard for us to understand. What are they protecting? I don't see how people who are saying these things think that they're fighting for good. There's a line in episode seven where Galadriel says every war is fought from without and within. And, and that's basically a line that he probably wrote. Um, even if you're fighting for something you think is good, if you do something worse in that fight, then you become evil. I don't see how people who are saying these things think that they're fighting for good. It's patently evil. So he basically just called everyone who was criticizing the show genuinely evil. And these are the guys who basically just got a brand new three-year deal with Amazon to continue on doing uh, this uh, show that basically nobody likes and nobody cared about and nobody asked for. So with all that being said, I want to throw it to my expert panel of nerds here. Um, and we're, we're going to start with you, Odin, because, you know, with your big brain, you've obviously been been keeping track of like, you know, how much uh, money Amazon's been spending on this stuff. And they just keep throwing good money after bad when it comes to this stuff. What was the reality of how successful this show was for Amazon after spending close to a billion dollars on its first season? There was no reality. It's it's a complete fiction. If they've made anything from this, they're clearly they're hiding it well because none of us can really find any any possible way that they would have made any money because as you mentioned, even that article of which typically, you know, shills for Amazon, even they had to admit, yeah, the show's completion rate's not very good. And I, that immediately made me start to think, because I bring it up all the time, when you look at the, the Rotten Tomatoes critic score for the series, and remembering that if he's going to be blaming, this cr creator is going to be blaming review bombing and things like that, and saying everything's really strong, everything's going well, a lot of people are watching it. Let's talk about how it started off where 160 plus reviews were posted for the first episode. And by the last episode, it was down to 26. So all of these key critics, all of these big critics, all these names were happy to watch the first episode and review it positively, but apparently they didn't like it enough to keep watching all the way through and do reviews for each individual episode. Only 26 actually stayed from first episode to last episode. Yep. So if that's where even the professional shill critics are standing with this, how can they in any way try to convince somebody that their show has been successful? As you mentioned, the data clearly does not show this, but I think that's an even stronger indication when the people that are most likely to like what you're doing, the people that are most likely to cheerlead you, and clearly they did because when you look at the season's overall ratings, it says 83% fresh. Yes, based off of 160 ratings in the first episode and then only down to 26 Kind of need to find some way of saying, by the way, this only accounts for 26 uh, actual reviewers who reviewed every single episode, who actually watched the entire show, who can actually, you know, speak to the entirety of the show itself and not just what the first episode that they probably got to watch for free, probably got a nice little package while they were watching it too. And so it makes sense as to why they gave such a positive review in the first place. So, yeah, I honestly don't know. And clearly it's because Amazon is already such a massive corporation that it can just basically write these things off or hide them somewhere because again, there's no way they've made any money from this. And this just shows you how much of an activist the people behind the scenes are. Yeah. And uh, you know, Tom, I, I want to throw this to you now because you know, you and I, we've talked about Jennifer Salky before and how like just irresponsible with money she seems to be. And it's also one of those things where I, I don't know if she's really that delusional to think, Oh, like this shows a success or uh, she just basically, uh, you know, is is doing like PR spin. But at the same time, if she's doing that, why give these two guys who have zero track record uh, control of the the biggest franchise that uh, that Amazon has ever created, and then keep re-upping their contracts? Uh, you know, especially considering that the fan backlash to this, it again, it shows apathy. It shows like when you can't make it past the fourth episode of a series. And it just like the the viewership falls off, you know the uh, the cliff. Why keep doing the, the thing that's not working? Yeah, I mean, really, kind of reminds you of the whole Batwoman thing. You got to think basically at this point they don't just to save face. I guess. I mean, not that it's saving anybody's face, but uh, 
you question, I mean, what contracts do they have in place that, you know, keep them involved in this somehow that they just won't get rid of them? I don't understand. Cause you're right. Like this reminds me of the whole star Trek thing. They basically spent a bunch of money on this and they used it to try and draw people into Amazon. Cause Amazon's biggest problem was they had a ton of people who sign up for Amazon prime, but at that point when uh, Lord of the Rings came out or was being ramped up, maybe 30% of their people that actually have Amazon prime watched the video section. So they knew they had this huge untapped base, but those are people who already have your stuff. So that didn't make any sense to me. So part of this was clearly to bring in new people and I'm sure it worked for about an episode or two, but once people saw what this was and they realized that it's not what they thought it was, they tuned out and they're stuck making it now. I mean, I don't, maybe it's cheaper just to keep her. I guess that's the only thing I can think of. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, I mean, why divorce when it's just cheaper to keep her at this point? Well, well, one of the interesting things about season two was that it was actually one of the few productions that wasn't affected by the actors and writers strike simply because a lot of the, the union people were based out of the UK and they were actually like mostly done with filming by the time the, those strikes hit. So they were actually able to complete season two. Um, but I want to throw this to Rob because Rob, you know, like we just spent like an hour talking about Star Trek and all the DEI stuff that basically alienated the hardcore viewers in, in favor of short term hits from like the media and activists to say like how great this stuff is. And one of the biggest issues with um, Rings of Power is that they're doing the same weird DEI stuff where they're like putting like masculine female characters at the forefront or race swapping characters. They're introducing, you know, know, like, like a diverse cast into the mix here. And the overwhelming criticism from fans hasn't been, oh, we don't like black people, we don't like women. It's that this isn't accurate to the mythology that Tolkien himself set up for this stuff. You guys are, are actively changing stuff that you know doesn't need to be changed just in favor of diversity so wh- why do you think you know amazon would basically take this prized ip and drive it into the ground by doing that type of thing i uh I- i'm perplexed by a lot of this because you can look over at what george r, r. martin and company did with house of the dragon you know where where they took a show i mean uh, let's face it seasons three uh seven and eight of 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 uh game of thrones were not as successful you know they weren't just off book they tried to compress everything and they literally were going against their own logic it yeah, was maddening they almost destroyed the franchise yeah the term in terms of even time how long does it take for one person to send a raven to dragonstone and somebody to come back when we know that in the first season it took robert baratheon a month to go from king's landing to winterfell and by the time it just didn't make any sense and now it's three minutes uh, yeah, and so <laughs> and that was their own mythology. But House of the Dragon was a terrific show. I think we can all say it was a terrific show for a prequel series. Sure. When you when you look at what they're doing, what I find strange is that you should always be in service of whatever IP you're there to steward. Whatever you've paid the most it's the most expensive TV show by a wide margin ever made with maybe the exception of Citadel also on Amazon, that was a disaster. But if you, if you were looking at the IP that you're the custodian of this weird thing, and it's happening across the board where there's a thought that, okay, this IP is very successful, but it's old. So we're going to come in and we, we, us who have no credibility are going to change it and try and update like why would you want to update a show that takes place in a, basically in a medieval period of time or a prehistory and make it like today? The, I mean, that that thought process is bizarre to me. The world was different then. And if you assume, as Tolkien did, he's like, I'm going to create a mythology for England, England in a time of prehistory, perhaps. So the idea that you would then try and update that is ridiculous. It would be the same. Arrogance. And and we're seeing that across the board. Let's make Anne Boleyn a person of color. Now, I understand that that we now live in a... a first of all, America was on a good path for inclusion. <laughs> you know, right. we, we were doing great. The civilization was evolving. Things like gay marriage were law of the land. Everything. 
if you go back around 2013, all of this new DEI stuff was purposefully injected into our civilization, our culture. And the question is why? What is it that they're trying to prove here? Are you trying to atone for the sins of the past? I mean, the last 2,000 years of history for humanity isn't so great. We're not nice people. So this idea that we want to take these IPs, the whole point of an IP is that it exists. It has a fan base. First and foremost, they're the first people that are going to buy your product. They're your front line. They're the canary in the coal mine. If your fans don't like something, it's a good bet the rest of civilization who aren't fans are not going to suddenly become fans. They're not going to like it either. So right. this thinking is bizarre to me. And, and like if you're going to go in and suddenly – you're telling these stories that are, they're inauthentic. I like to call it fraudulent creation, where the, 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 the showrunners are trying to do what? I don't understand. Are you trying to appeal to, uh, you're, you're talking about, a, remember, a minority audience. Now, on a global scale, um, say white people are about 13% on, on a global scale, which means the, the DEI initiatives and the demonization of, of white cis males like us makes no sense, not on a global level. And if you're Amazon, you're making shows for the planet. So the DEI initiatives you're talking about are very um, uh, America-centric. They don't really make sense in the rest of the world. So what are you trying to do? I, I really don't understand. And I don't understand why anyone would lead with this. Lead with great stories. You'll never lose if you tell great, compelling stories with great characters that and, feel authentic and, to the and, story and that you're telling. In fact, Robert, when they released this stuff in other parts of the world, they actively changed the things that they were pushing down our throats. Yep. Yes. The marketing, I, because yeah. they, they get rejected everywhere else. Yeah, I well, I we know the answer to why this is. Sorry, go ahead, man. No, so I, say, I can't imagine going to Japan and taking a show like uh, Ninja Family, which is on Netflix right now, and going, oh, by the way, 30% of your family has to be white people, 20% yeah. has to be gay. House of Ninjas. House, no, it's Ninja Family is what it's called. It's a family, I, I believe. I don't know, whatever. You guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't watch just, this. I don't give a crap just, what it is. It's, it's got it's ninjas actually, in the house. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, Everything ninja. is made really better with ninjas. <laughs> it's a really right. good show. But, uh, you know, can you imagine it's like, okay, you got this show about Japanese people in Tokyo and they're all ninjas, but you got to have, you know, 40% of them got to be this and 20% of the cast has to be that. And it's just, Good luck. it's crazy. It's crazy. It's just, <laughs> on, yeah. I yeah. think the answer to this is, is in, um, you know, film threats, more recent report. I don't think that what they're reporting is isolated just to women in animation or just to Disney. I think this is across the board and this is something we've noticed. Because we've even had them tell us why they're doing these things, right? They're doing it to 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 basically make us buy into this whole thing. And they'll say, well, why don't you just make an original character, right? Well, for instance, Ted Biacelli, the guy who worked on Master of the Universe Re Re Revelations and Revolutions, he said the reason they race swapped one of the characters that already existed instead of just creating a wholly new character was that the audience wouldn't care if it was a new character. It's like, oh. Well, so you're saying that the only time the audience is going to care is if you take something they already know mm -hmm. and swap it for them. That's the mentality they have because to them, they can't create something new and get the attention. They're literally using it. It's just like we were talking about with streaming services before and all that stuff. But what, what, what Film Threat reported on was that women in animation thing and that in that women in animation thing, instead of actually teaching women skills that would get them better jobs, all they were teaching them was how to get rid of the old white men. Yep. That's it. Not how to do their jobs, not actually how to do anything or nurture their talents if they had any. Right. And that's what I think is the problem across the board. It's not just there. It's when it comes to writing, acting, producing, directing across the board. There's these programs that are pushing people into this stuff, whether they want to be there or not, whether they're qualified or not. And what we're ending up with is Star Trek Discovery, Lord of Rings of Power, and all this other kind of crap that nobody wants yeah. and nobody asks for. Because it's a religious and cult. That's what that's it, what is. It, is. it is. It is. And, and Odin is an expert on religion. But I want to throw this to Brian real quick. Uh, Brian, uh, you know, the thing that really hit me in this article was how they're like, Tolkien fans are known for being fascist adjacent. And uh, and the, the sheer level of animosity that not only the people who make the show, but also the people who are promoting the show and stuff like that seem to have for the fans of this material 
just is astonishing to me. And has, has, in your opinion, has there ever been a strategy where you attack the fan base and it actually works out better for the IP? No, not, not once. It doesn't, you know, abandoning the fans and not, no, so taking a step further, first you abandon them and then you uh, attack them. And then you are mad when your show, your movie, your project fails, and then you blame them. <laughs> it's like, what did you expect to happen? Imagine walking into someone's house, kicking their dog, stealing their uh, their uh, their beer out of their fridge, smacking him in the face, and then walking out and crashing your car into a pole, and then suing the person <laughs> you just beat up. It makes no sense. You know the crazy thing is this brainwash this uh this the problem is really brainwashing. I think a lot of people think that there's this like malicious thing going on with like we want to remove uh the family unit. We want to push our DEI agenda. We want to and maybe there's a little bit of maliciousness going on, but on the studio side, I think a lot of people just don't want to be the next person to be canceled or fired or lose their job. And so they just sort of go along with it. And they go along to get along long enough to where they actually start believing the nonsense. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have friends in, uh, in Hollywood, friends in the industry, that you talk to them in private and they're like, this whole DEI thing is insane. It makes it impossible to, make, to, to work, makes it impossible to write, makes it impossible to, make it, to, uh, to create a show or a movie. Um, we hate it, but we, you know, we gotta do what we gotta do to keep getting hired, right? And then you talk to them two years later and they're the same guys they are like, hey, man, you're being pretty bigoted right now. And you're like, and you can watch in real time that the longer you spend in that environment, that toxic environment, the, long, and the longer you have to, you know, go along to get along, the more brainwashed you become because it's a constant, never ending, relentless drip, 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 it stops. drip. It never stops. And even if you're a smart guy or woman, you know, with with great, great ideas. And you think you're just playing the system so you can keep your job and create cool content and sort of subversively create good stuff within that system. Because of the relent the relentless, never-ending drip, 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 you start yourself to start thinking the same way these insane people think. Don't, and it's insanity. It's, again, it's a literal insanity. Cult, right? Don't you feel like is. you feel like maybe they're playing a super long game that the rest of us haven't? You know, I don't think they care about my generation. I think people in my generation are, you know, are just Gen Xers. Oh, Kathleen we're, Kennedy we're, said we're we're, uh, we're we're stuck in our mindset. I don't give a shit about any of these people and this DEI stuff. But you know, you you go down to my grandkids' generation; they're being inundated with this stuff from day one. Oh, they're brainwashed entirely. They're 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 they're, they're, they're going to be a lost generation you know yep. they're, they're just waiting for us to die and this the, and, and in and in 20 years from now 30 years from now when i'm in my 80s or whatever um our country is going to be unrecognizable as far as all of this i actually don't agree with you shit. It already Honestly, is. But, but brian we got to do something no no I mean, six months listen. six months ago i would have agreed with you and then i got to actually talk to a bunch of these 10 and 12 year olds at my kids school and in my in our community center and mm -hmm. bro, the generation coming up behind this last generation are based as f. Good. Yes, That's they are. Great. It well, is it might crazy. Even be problematic my kid, in the sense that, can yeah. I tell? Can I tell a joke? My kid told me two days ago that I was afraid to share it on my my stream, but this is not my stream, so I get to tell it. <laughs> she walks in, and I'm ending my I'm ending my Monday stream. She goes, "Dad, Dad," and I'm like, "What's up?" She goes, "What do you call a, a school a school shooter with cerebral mm -hmm. um, with uh, with Down syndrome?" And I'm like what she goes what do you call a school shooter with down syndrome and i'm like what she goes special forces <laughs> she oh runs out of the room wow Whereas i well, die laughing kind of problematic we're almost this whole thing is almost creating a whole gener new another generation of bigots right. and racists that's the problem well and the thing the, is the pendulum always swings the rebellious nature that's in most teenagers is a, a self-correcting factor it's self-correcting you know well, i'm sorry you know, I mean, Tom. Uh, I, look, I think there's there's something else too that uh, people are forgetting. None of this works, right? It doesn't work, and so mm. they're they're trying to apply these platforms. We see it in the f failure of these franchises. It doesn't work because what they forget is 
they everybody assumes that there's the exact same amount of people across the board that are being i don't know kept out of something it's like the the, the talk in hollywood if you think about the demographics of this, look at YouTube. Look at the shows right now. All of us have YouTube channels. Who watches our YouTube channels? Dudes. Guys. Right. Women are not interested in, and I'm not saying all women. I'm making a generalization. Mm -hmm. And there are some great, some of my favorite YouTubers, like Impression Blend, um, who reads great books and loves, she loves horror films and all that. But for the most part, the people in this space are predominantly male. 96% of my audience is men. 96%. Now, I I'm not I talk about Hollywood, I talk about lots of things, but the thing is women's fandom works differently than men's fandom does. And it was great to see over the like the 90s and the 2000s how women came into fandom through gaming, through manga, through uh, animation like Sailor Moon were brought in and from a young age became fans. But men and women are inherently different kinds of people. And we're trying to tell people that they're not. But if you look at the things people like and are attracted to, of course they are. Our world, and what they're trying to do is to say everybody's exactly the same. Everybody likes exactly the same things in exactly the same way. And anyone who's been a fan knows that's not true. There are people that love Star Wars that don't like Star Trek. There are people that don't understand Dune, think it's boring. They don't understand somebody making a European art film in addition to trying to make a science fiction thriller. There's all kinds of things, and yet all these DEI initiatives, the premise is that everybody's the same. And that's ridiculous. People, equality is different from each individual being themselves. And and what this DEI stuff is trying to do is make everyone the same person. Yeah, And it doesn't and work that I, way. It doesn't work that way, but I, I want to throw this to Vader real quick. Vader, you, you know, during season one of The Rings of Power, every Saturday morning on Salty mm -hmm. Saturday, we had a segment dedicated to reviewing the previous episode. And of course, you, you know, uh, we got uh, Jeff out of it. Uh, yeah, Jeff was Jeff! Jeff! The best character Jeff. in the entire show. We miss Jeff. The tree. Ho hopefully we'll have another character like Frank or someone like that to uh, we can rally around. Maybe a bush two. will come up. Uh, but but so, ma so many uh, YouTube channels are very happy that we're getting a season two because it's basically job security for this sure. little entertainment tube niche that we're going for. Uh, are, do you have any interest at all in season two? And would you watch it if you weren't forced to for this? Um, stream? Maybe just out of morbid curiosity, I might watch the first couple episodes. I don't know at this point though, you know, when it comes to shows like that, I, I put it in the same category as far as what we do as a show like uh, invasion. You know, it's like we have we have a great time getting together and sitting around and just talking <laughs> mad shit about this terrible AI generated television show. You, you know, um, it makes for it makes for good YouTube videos, right? You know, so uh, that show, yeah, the most the boring worst. alien invasion show ever made. Yeah, it's the worst. <laughs> right. There are no but aliens we, in that alien yeah. invasion show. But we do. You, you know, these shows are good for stuff in our little youtube world it is fun to get together with nerds and and talk about stuff you uh in these cases i guess we love to hate i guess um i don't know um i also like to get together and talk about stuff i like like uh you know game of thrones and house of the dragon um i want to talk about shogun that that show's gotten off to a really good start yes it has um you know i'm interested in the walking dead again all of a sudden because look rick and michonne are back and um I, I I like that show. The, you know the those who live. That's another good one. It seems like uh, there are a few good things on television right now. And but I don't know if I would like the Walking Dead show as much if I hadn't given it a six year break after they got rid of Rick on the bridge back in the day. But uh, uh no, as far as Lord of the Rings goes, I mean yeah, we're, we'll watch it so we can discuss it. But if I if I was just on my own maybe just out of morbid curiosity, but probably, probably not. If, if, if a squirrel jumped in from the television, I'll probably get distracted and do something different, but yeah. Well guys, you know, speaking of um, stuff that talking about stuff that we love to hate, let's talk a little bit about Marvel. Shall we? 
Boy, we're, yes. hitting, we're, hitting, we're hitting the trifecta today. Just yes. the, the things that we yes. don't care about, but really like to talk about. Is that, is that what we're doing? Is that, the yeah, that that's exactly yeah. what we're doing. So um, it's kind of funny because Ray Winston, who was the bad guy in the <laughs> black widow movie, he was, he was interviewed on a um, like for radio times magazine. And he's got a couple movies coming out. So like he was doing the rounds and they specifically asked him about Marvel. And uh, he did not have kind things to say. So he was he was like, Marvel's fine until you have to do reshoots. And then you find out that a few producers have come down and, you're, and they say your performance is too much, it's too strong. That's the way Marvel works. And it can be soul destroying because you feel like you're doing great work. Um, and he actually said like, uh, you, you know, why don't you just recast me instead of like, you, you know, like having me do these reshoots because I don't, I don't really, you know, want to do this. But what's interesting about this is, is that if you read between the lines, so like Marvel is notorious for doing reshoots, right? And ba basically from what we've we've heard, you have a situation where actors get a script and they're like, this is a good script. I'm looking forward to making this movie. And then they shoot the script and Marvel comes back and they're like, you need to do reshoots and you need to change all this stuff. And essentially Ray Winston in his role in Black Widow, they, they thought like, you know, you're too big. Your, your acting was too over the top. You need to tone it down a bit. And so like he had to go in and basically he reshot every single scene that he did in that movie. And he had to reshoot it by like toning down his villainness, I guess you could say. And this seems to be par for the course for, uh, for Marvel movies uh, where they basically come in and they like completely shoot like entirely different movie. And Tom, I, I want to throw this to you because basically you have some inside knowledge about like quantum mania and what the hell happened with that movie where it was one movie to begin with. And then it became a completely different movie throughout the course of reshoots. Yeah. Um, much like what Ray is saying here in this interview, uh, the actors and the director specifically went in thinking they were making one movie. Uh, then Bob Iger came back in the picture and he's like, I don't like it. I want, I think it should be funnier. I think it's too dark. And Peyton and everybody else involved were very happy with the picture as it was. And reportedly, it probably was a better movie, movie at the end of the day because then they went and did a buttload of reshoots to inject a bunch of humor into it. Uh, so I'm not surprised by this. I'm sure he probably was too scary or something like that or whatever. Who knows? You know, at this point, are we surprised by this? I'm not. It's more like par for the course. I mean, it's like what Marvel movie hasn't been reshot completely at this point? I mean, I made the joke, and it's probably not even a joke. That's the truth. When I said, why are we freaking out about Captain America 4? They're just reshooting three sequences, act one, two, and three. You know? So. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, Brian, Brian as, our, as one of our client book experts on here, because you have a channel dedicated to DC, um, you, you know, when Ray Winston says that it's soul crushing recently, we had an issue with, uh, with Brie Larson where she was asked like, you know, like, what's your future in the Marvel universe? And she's like, does anybody even want me to do it? Uh, you know, like I have nothing to say about this. So like you, you can tell that the actors themselves are very frustrated with the whole process. You have that whole thing with, um, with Joss Whedon when he was shooting the Avengers too, where, where he basically said like, yeah, there was a lot of you know, after I shot the movie, the studio came in and forced me to put in like all this stuff for Ragnarok and like, you know, other stuff. And it just seems like the, the Marvel formula for the movies is, is like, okay, we're going to take what was already made and screw it up. Right. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I've shared this a couple of times. I'm a little confused as to why, and, and I don't have an answer for this, but I'll, I'll, I'll share with you the problem and what's confusing me in this problem they have all the numbers like comic book comic book movies are super unique in the fact that you know exactly what your fans like and you have all the numbers on what they purchased and what sub characters they supported and what stories they found the most interesting which ones they followed the most you have all this information over like 50 years of what characters they liked Bought, uh, what what stories were most interesting to the main fan base, and what happened with comic book movies? Your main fan base is going to be the people that are rabid about these certain characters, and they're going to drag other people into their uh, <clears throat> mental uh, 
you know, uh, insanity to come watch these movies. And when they get there, those people might become fans too. And then you start developing a fan base that is sort of self-perpetuating more and more fans. But what they're doing now is they're deciding that the comic books that people hated the most, the stories they hated the most, the characters they hated, the ones they didn't buy, the ones they didn't support, the ones that no one cared about, the ones that were in the dollar comic book bin because no one bought them, the ones that people used for, you know, the, the owner of the comic book shop would use as toilet paper because it's been sitting there for three years. And they'd be like, you know what? Let's make those stories and let's make those characters. And even worse, let's replace the characters that made, made us successful that everyone loves with these characters. Let's literally take the characters that no one likes, kill off or remove those pr previously loved characters and replace them with these characters. And the, the thought, the, what doesn't make sense to me is that they had this information. No one likes Ironheart. No one. I don't know a single comic book fan that ever was like, I gotta go get the next Ironheart issue. No one liked it. It didn't sell. Miss Marvel, no one bought Miss Marvel. First off, it was invented like in 2012. No one yeah, bought over it over and over again. They didn't buy yeah. it, and they didn't buy it. They kept they kept trying, and no one bought it. But let's replace Iron Man with Ironheart. And you're, you're, the question, and Tom had a great great way to fix that uh, last week. But the question I have is, if it's for DEI purposes, why don't you use just use the black guy that everyone likes? War Machine's right there. He's still alive. It's played by a fantastic actor, Don Cheadle. You already have your DEI is already there. You don't need to actually replace Iron Man with a character that you, by the numbers, literally no one wants to wants to read about. Okay, same with Falcon taking over Captain America. You already have what you need. Bucky's already there. It's not like Falcon's gonna go bye bye if Bucky takes over. You've already established them as partners. You, you don't need to then give him the mantle of Captain America when you have Bucky sitting there. And, and in you, the comics, already... Bucky was the first replacement for Captain America. And in the comics that people watched, that people read, that people purchased and supported, Bucky was Captain America. So just, you already have your DER requirements on screen. Let's go a step further, though, and destroy what people love and replace it with people what people obviously, and by the numbers, don't love. It makes no sense. So I can't answer you because it's not a DEI thing because they already have the DEI. They have the checkbox already checked. But they go further to actually destroy the things that people love. So it's not... It's I don't think it's a DEI issue. I don't think it's a, a virtual signaling thing. I, and I can't answer what it is. But it doesn't make sense. It's look. It's almost like someone's... Like, like Alex Kurtzman dropping the stock so they can buy buy it from Disney or something. It makes It's a very odd choice to make because they already have the characters yeah. they need to check the and boxes they need. To go even Robert, further, Monica Rambeau. Like, for me, the female mm -hmm. Captain Marvel was Monica Rambeau in the 80s. With already the there. fro and the black and white. She was awesome. She was an yeah. Avenger. I yeah. love Monica Rambeau as Captain Marvel. And no one liked the... Look, Carol Danvers, to me, is Miss Marvel. Carol Danvers was the right. character when Rogue first appeared with the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants in Avengers Annual 10. She got thrown off a bridge when Rogue took her powers. I mean, that was when you met Rogue, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants in that comic. one of my favorite superhero single issues ever. And I, I, I look at this. There, Marvel did such a good job for the first 23 movies, for the most part. Even when things were... You go back and you watch Iron Man 2. It's way more entertaining than you remember it being. Yeah. Same with Age of Ultron. I'm, like Brian, perplexed. But I'm sorry, you were going to ask me something. Yeah, I was just going to ask you. So, like the the whole thing, like where it seems like the consensus among Marvel actors is that it's a soulless process, because they'll go in, they'll give it their all in the first round, and then when the the, the suits come in and like, oh, you need to redo this entire thing, and they're just like, uh, like like I already gave you my best, and and so now they just kind of phone it in. How do you think that? Because it's obvious that Marvel had like a a system in place that they felt, oh, this is why we got so big, and they're continuing with that system of like executives coming in and rewriting stuff at the last minute and requiring, you know, like, like really quick turnaround on special effects and stuff like that. You know, you know, with, with your experience in filmmaking, Robert, like, like how, how is this sustainable for, for any type of like, you know, coherent studio to keep, keep doing and, and getting good results from? Well, it, it isn't. And, and we've seen the collapse, the utter collapse of Marvel. And I think what, what is, uh, look, 
I, I like to hear that we brought up the idea that it was Bob Iger. This is the same problem that Star Wars has. It's not Kathleen Kennedy. It's the studio that owns Star Wars. It's always been the studio. Mm -hmm. It's always been that problem because everyone else is beholden to the studio. Kevin Feige wields power up to the point where the studio, where Bob Iger, the people that see the, the, the thing is, it's all about fear and control because the amount of money Marvel became wildly successful. And the people, the powers that be that are beholden to the shareholders, beholden to the investors like BlackRock, it's not Kevin Feige. Kevin Feige is a creative. It's not his fault. The people that are blamed are the people like the Bob Igers. I mean, you, you don't see, you know, even Kevin Feige, who knows what he's doing, but he's hamstrung by, he was completely not, he, 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 he defeated Ike Perlmutter and he was able to keep his nose to the grindstone and make the movies of the Infinity Saga that were working. Then what happens? Disney Plus comes along and the, it, it didn't matter. They're like, we're going to make this many Star Wars shows and we're going to make this many Marvel shows as if it's easy to make good entertainment. They forgot. It isn't. You know, and they come along and suddenly they have to make six shows. They're already making three or four movies a year, which is a, a, a huge task in itself. But Marvel, and this is, this is how they think of these things. It's not just you can't just decide to go make six shows and just because they're Marvel, they're going to miraculously be good. Every piece of entertainment is only as good as the creative people and, and the collaboration, great creativity in, in, in the movie industry and TV is the combination of art and commerce. It's that collision and it's the push pull and you need both. But what happens is when money overrides the creativity and that's what happened with the marvel tv shows they don't have enough talent and there's there's they were put way too much pressure they don't have enough talent and they don't have enough time and so they have to deliver and you wind up with something like she hulk you know then you have you're hiring these people that are activists already and they subvert they take what they're supposed to do you have the john byrne run of she hulk and you have ali mcbeal and la law and whatever just do that but oh no, no, that's not what they did. I mean, and Marvel used to look, look at the whole Ed Brubaker Winter Soldier run. They made arguably the best Marvel movie in Captain America Winter Soldier. Yep. They looked at their, they looked at the comic run, the successful comic run, as Brian pointed out, that everybody loved. Brubaker's run on Captain America is a stellar run on Captain yeah, America. It is. It's absolutely fantastic. I, I spent one afternoon, I, I hadn't read the run and I bought the three omnibuses and I read them all in one sitting. I was in bed for like 12 hours. Just I couldn't get through it fast enough. I was so absorbed. And they looked at that and made Winter Soldier. That's the that's the model. It's they right. did it already. Now, what happens is that Marvel becomes as successful as it is, and everybody wants a piece. Everybody decides, okay, we're gonna build our streaming platform on Star Wars and Disney. I mean, on Star Disney builds it on Star Wars and Marvel. How did that work out for them? Their streaming service is failing. Because those shows weren't as good as they should have been. Because there was unreal expectations put on these creatives to, to suddenly like do five times the work and you expect it to be the same as Infinity War and Endgame. And that's not how it works. That's not how entertainment works. Uh, and I, that's I, the problem. I, I want to throw this to Tom. Tom, do you have a counterpoint? Yeah, I, sorry, RMB. I disagree with you completely. Yes, Bob Iger is to blame, but so is Kevin Feige and Kathleen Kennedy because... You just said it yourself. The person who had the checks and balances there, Ike Perlmutter, him and Bob worked together behind the scenes to get rid of them so they could make stuff like Captain Marvel. They wanted to make stuff like this. Bob's first instinct was not to trust George Lucas's script, bring in somebody else. And who was that somebody else that was there already that George picked? Kathleen Kennedy. Can't blame Bob for that. And Kathleen Kennedy said exactly what I was pointing out earlier when Matt was talking about this. The old fans, they're on the verge of dying. We need to get the new blood in here. So we need to make this all about the whammons and diversities. That was Kathleen Kennedy, not Bob Iger. Weird. Okay, so as much I as you want I was to dying blame, so soon. I'm only 42. What's going on? Well, <laughs> yeah, well, that's what she said. This is not about the Luke Skywalker fans. Okay, Luke Skywalker's an old white dude. That's exactly what she said. The original plan at Disney Parks was to be around the sequel or the original prequel and the and the original trilogy 
she was the one who insisted that it be all about the sequels because going forward is the future oh. and that was star wars well hang on that a second it's said. it's different look what they wanted to do Kevin was Feige cool. also had uh, a bunch of people helping him early on too that he doesn't have anymore either like james yep. gunn and uh, john favreau joe johnston to name yep. a few but sorry and, and joss you know, whedon all due respect and joss whedon no but I but I would, they do need to be held to task though that's okay but point. here but here's the thing the idea of creating star wars for a new generation is a sound idea it's a sound idea because that's you want the, cost the, you, the original you want, though that was the problem you want the, well that's i was going to say that's the real problem but from a business perspective i understand what disney wants to do and what they should have done is you 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 do what they did in the comics do what they did in the extended universe they already had a template they just decided to not pay attention to it but the what they ended up doing was rather than taking and and making something that felt organic like we saw beginning with the heir to the empire trilogy in the dark empire comic series in 91 which those writers knew how to they gave us a new generation they gave us the the solo twins they gave us uh luke's wife they gave it mara jade or whatever they gave all those things were already done and they were done effectively what disney because they didn't know about it they hired somebody who on paper jj abrams looked like a decent creator even though i would say he was the wrong person to pick and his mandate was to sort of reinvent star wars now i don't think the mandate was to necessarily make some girl boss in ray but jj abrams had a track record of creating strong female characters on TV. So his first impulse was to do the same thing that he did on television. I don't think someone told him. I don't think Kathleen Kennedy ever said, you need to make this character a female. That was his choice. And what he ended up doing was he came in and, and retold A New Hope because he doesn't know how to do anything original that's actually interesting and good and he didn't go back and read those comics and he didn't do due diligence he took the easy tv way out because he's a tv maker well, he's not uh, a feature filmmaker robert i i'd argue that um you know um kathleen kennedy brought jj on because they are kind of aligned and i'm pretty sure that considering all the the kathleen kennedy surrogates that we've seen in every star wars property since she took over that she does mandate that you know some type of diversity or female is like and Indiana Jones oh, 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 and Willow. Of, of course, of course. I mean, I and I I would say that, but I would also say it's the creators themselves that are to blame. Yeah, I mean, Kat, you, you because you can tell a great story with female characters. Nobody has a problem with that. We've been watching great female characters. Joss Whedon gave us great seasons of Buffy. You get a bad James cook, Cameron. You're gonna get, James, getting, you're going to get a terrible meal. And I think uh, you have. I, it's mutual. It's mutual blame. All right. Yeah, and I think the, I, I, the best example of this is Solo. Right. They filmed a huge portion of the film, and then because of creative differences, right, which means what they probably didn't align with what her vision was. They they end up getting you know canned. So like that's what well, I look at. Well, but like, that was because Lawrence all on Kasdan her, was upset but, though. Mm, I, again, I think that a lot of it is there's behind the scenes problems on every I, project that they do. I, I want to move this over to Odin uh, real quick. So Odin. You, you know, I think the Marvels was a big wake up call, not just for the Marvel Studios, but Disney as well, that, you know, their their uh, ability to get by with their current system just isn't going to work anymore. And so, like, you know, last week we actually talked about how Marvel is quietly retooling the, the MCU, like their plans going forward and stuff like that. But when it comes to like the actors, you know, um, involved with this stuff and everyone just feeling like it's soulless, the, the studio comes in and meddles and, and ruins everything. And yet the studio is still going to be the one dictating this stuff. Like, you, you know, uh, someone just mentioned all the creatives that started off the MCU, like John Favreau and, you know, like people like him who are actually talented storytellers. And yet uh, Marvel has moved to directors that they can control and producers mm -hmm. who don't read the source material and are actually told not to read the source material. So how do you think from a financial perspective, uh, people not wanting to work with Marvel going forward because it's so soul crushing is going to have an impact on the studio? Uh, it's not going to get any better. I mean, like you, you already look at what they've done ever since, right? The, the, everything really came to a head. I think COVID did a lot of things. And I think one of the things it did was it really exposed just how shallow uh, Marvel had had become right. They had begun. They've gotten to this point where they were just cruising. They said, "Okay, we don't need 
the most well thought out stories. We don't need the best persons behind the camera. We don't need to be focusing on more traditional forms of, of storytelling because all we need to do is follow this, this general formula, put Marvel on it. And if we can do that, that means, okay, we can make a lot of money. And sure enough, that actually ended up stopping, right? We were already seeing it start to, you know, slow down. I think COVID just sped up, you know, the entire process. And we know that, you know, because obviously many of the excuses still exist where people say, well, one of the reasons why you know, Marvel's not doing as well is because of, of COVID. It's like, yeah, but then how can you explain films like Top Gun Maverick or films more so in the comic book space, films like Spider-Man No Way Home, right, which were able to do things that, you know, I remember Spider-Man No Way Home when that came out the week before the weekend, the opening weekend for the West Side Story remake had happened and all the excuses were being made saying, oh, well, this movie didn't do well because of COVID. A week later, all of a sudden, COVID must have disappeared because all of a sudden people were going to see a movie again and people kept going and going and going, right? Because it was the product that people were, were, were being brought to. There was good marketing for it. And they were actually giving fans what they wanted to see. Imagine that concept. And so when you already have that going downhill, and we've talked about this extensively about how Marvel has not made a film that has been profitable in the last few years, right? You look at like films like The Marvels, right? Make you know, losing over $200 million. And you look to the fact that even going back to Endgame, including the profits from Endgame, they're still working at a loss, right? They, they, they have not made anything really since 2019 overall in the grand scope, just looking at it from that, uh, you know, from the national box office or from the, from just the box office standpoint. And you look at now the people coming out talking about how toxic it is. Okay, this is just confirming things that we've already seen because of things like in Star Wars, right? Whether it's the all of the behind the scenes chaos, creators being changed, you know, all the time. The worst case of being, I think, solo because so much of it had been filmed before, you know, anything actually happened and it just ballooned the cost and it lost, you know, countless dollars. And now you look also to Marvel and how Marvel has also been having the same thing. And as you said, bringing on directors that had almost no credits to their name except for some random indie films because why? They were able to justify their choice by whatever indie film they made, but at the same time knew, oh, they don't have enough experience to be able to strong arm themselves and to push against the things that we want them to do and we want them to focus on. And this is something that's just been exposed over and over. I'm reminded of that one uh, female director who who had, uh, I think, either turned something down or she like shared her story after about how she was told, oh, by the way, you're not going to be directing any of the action sequences. And she was like, uh, well, OK, then I'm not mm -hmm. doing your movie. Is that the Captain, uh, the Black Widow one, wasn't it? I think that may have been Black yep. Widow. Yeah. And so it's like, this is all just stuff that most of us have known about and just happy that finally some of it's being talked about. But I think the damage is so far gone, it's going to take years for them to recover. Well, and I lost yeah. respect for Kevin Feige when James Gunn came out and said that he was the one who had to map out the Infinity Saga because they didn't have anybody to do it. Mm -hmm. He's like, I, I, I was hired to do Guardians of the Galaxy. He's like, yeah, we teased Thanos in, in Avengers, but we don't know what we're doing with him. That's what he said he was told. So he sat down for 90 minutes and mapped it all out so he knew how to write his movies because he basically had to figure out where he was going to go to tell his story. He was like the only one there, it sounded like, that was had any interest in, in setting up the future. And that explains why they constantly have this revolving door of like people who have to constantly go, well, I was there and I worked on this thing, but then they changed it all when I left because of the special effects and this and that and the other. So you got special effects houses saying the same thing, same thing over at Dis at, at star Wars, where you literally have a revolving door of directors. Like we're up to like 18 people at this point who have been hired for projects that have never come to fruition. Yeah. That's 18. And, uh, I, I want to throw this to, to Vader real quick because oh, no. Vader, a, a big, yeah. A big defense that uh, these studios use is, is like, oh, it's superhero fatigue. And I think the theme of today's episode of Salty Saturday is like uh, audience apathy. Sure. So how much, how much of, of you know, Marvel's current situation do you think is uh, audiences having actual superhero fatigue and apathy towards this stuff versus like people know that Marvel's bad and they're just waiting for it to course correct? Um. I think a lot of it has to do with people knowing Marvel's bad and they're waiting for it to course correct. There hasn't been anything good that Marvel's put out since, you know, the end of phase, what was it? Phase four when, when the Thanos stuff was finished, or was that phase three? In game. Yeah. So that was, I mean, that was the last movie I liked that they made was in game. And even it was getting a little bit to be a little bit much with their women power thing there at the end and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, 
Put you at least, power. And, you know, at least they wrapped it up and with, with and we got a we got a conclusion. They should have just ended it all there, you know, and then started over. But no, we have to go on and get all this MCU stuff going on. But uh, you know, there might be a little bit of superhero fatigue. Um, I just want to go watch a fun movie, but anymore, I don't have any desire to go watch a Marvel movie in the theater at all. Just it's just not something that's on my my radar when when a new movie comes out i'm like nope i'm just gonna wait till it comes out on 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 streaming or something and i don't even have the ability to do that anymore because i don't want to watch commercials with my uh my movies and i'm not going to give disney that extra five dollars a month or whatever but um no man um stupid hero fatigue i've never believed in it but i i, I kind of do now same same way with uh with with anything these these Disney studios put out. They just pumped out so much crap that they've kind of drilled it all into our head that it's subpar material and we're not we don't have to watch it. You know, I don't want to do homework to watch a movie. I think it's homework fatigue more than yeah, yeah. That, I think that's a good one. <laughs> homework fatigue is good. And I'm serious because I was talking yeah, no. to somebody just yesterday who would we we would consider a normie who's not into this stuff. Mm-hmm. And that was their number one gripe was right. I didn't watch any of these shows. Now I can't watch any of the movies or enjoy them because I'm not gonna sit through five marvel shows yeah right they basically told me the same thing that we've been saying for a while is they went in to go see dr strange thinking it was going to be a follow-up to spider-man and realized right. about halfway through that this is actually a sequel to a show they didn't watch right so they had okay. no idea what was going on i don't mind doing homework but that homework better be the movie that came before this one that got released right. last summer right yeah it can't be a TV you, know, show. Separate it. you need to be able to separate it exactly yeah That's it can't the be the tv when, when when they were doing phase one and two and agents of shield came out they smartly mm-hmm. and agents of shield fans complained about this i love agents of shield they're like why doesn't agents of shield have anything to do really have anything to do with the main franchise i'm like it shouldn't no it shouldn't let it be its own thing it can reference the the universe but the stories need to be completely separate. We don't want the movies to have to deal with the show. And if you ever do bring a character from that TV show into your movie, it should be introduced as a new character. And the extra you get from it will is the fans of that character from the show will, will feel a little extra warmth. But the, mm-hmm. it shouldn't be it shouldn't be like you know this character already. It should be introduced as a new character. That's the same thing about um uh, all the DC stuff when they were when, when they were doing the Snyder Cut and all of a sudden all the shows started to pop up on Matt and Max, people were like, oh, I can't wait to see Superman. I'm like, no, stop. We shouldn't. These things should not connect. They shouldn't connect. They can use the same universe, but they need to be separate. And they did they did that with the Defenders on Netflix. That was smart. They Part of the universe, sure, but separate. Once you start trying to you know cross these over with fan bases that are not watching the TV shows or you know um, into the movies, you, you get a lot of convolution. Mm-hmm. And we don't need that. Although I'm pretty excited about Deadpool 2. Uh, sorry, Deadpool 3. Sure. I think that Deadpool 3 has a very unique, and I've said it before, has a very unique um, opportunity to actually course correct and do so in a way that is sort of self-reflective. Yeah, but I, I, can look at, I can watch the Deadpool movies and I could completely separate them and put them in their yeah. own little pocket. Without I do too, yeah. Any issue they're not. They're, they have really nothing to do with Disney. Right. I mean, they do now because they've been acquired by Disney, mm-hmm. but they're not, they're, they're Fox movies. Wolverine yeah, right. and Deadpool. I mean, to me, it's the final Fox X-Men movie. Yeah, but dude, right. I mean, this is probably a whole other topic, but, but there's people like us on this panel and people in our chat that know better, but then there's people that go out and watch movies, which is the majority of the world Yeah, that probably aren't really aware of the separation between the Sony and the Disney stuff, right? I mean, yeah. oh yeah. So, so they got to be careful with how they do this stuff. It's like, is Madam Web is that movie in the MCU? Well, well, is, you, is, you is know, Venom like, in the MCU? Is it? You, you know, Vader. Um, the actors in Madam Web didn't know it was a yeah, movie. Well, I, I, like they, they were falsely, they were under the false uh, belief that this was a, <laughs> a Marvel Cinematic Universe film, and it just didn't. It wasn't true. And that's one of the reasons when why Dakota Spider-Man Johnson, is the only one technically. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one yeah. of the reasons why Dakota Johnson fired her representatives because they didn't yep. actually inform her of the actual movie that she was doing. But I, I want to, well, this is what we were saying quick, Amy Pascal putting, was doing. Yeah. I feel yeah. like putting Sony Spider-Man in the MCU just can kind of convoluted and confuse things yeah. personally. But yeah, but, but I mean like there were so many contractual things going on there, but I want to end this segment by throwing it to, to Rob to, you know, 
uh, wrap everything up. You know, Rob, the old Marvel comic book uh, uh, process was basically the artist would sit down, they'd write out, they draw out the panels, and then the writer would come in and figure out yep. a story <laughs> to, to put in into the bubbles. And it kind of feels like that's translated over to the movie side at this point. Um, do you think that there's any way for Marvel to kind of right the ship and, and turn this around and actually bring in people who care about the content and care about the fans and start giving the fans what they want? Uh, I, I do. I mean, a hundred percent. If, if, if you look, you have the same writing team writing winter soldier, civil war, infinity war and Endgame, Marcus and McFeely. And they had worked for Disney before on the Narnia films. And, um, I think what's really interesting is Marvel with, whether it was with Joss Whedon, whether it was with James Gunn, to a certain extent, those directors had their own distinct points of view. I mean, James Gunn, remember, he had made Sliver and Super, which were movies at three million bucks each. Oh, Slither. That was a and, great movie. And yeah, it was a great, but you can look at Slither and go, okay, the person who made that film at scale uh knows how to work with visual effects, know how to, knows how to work with an ensemble cast of characters. I mean, James Gunn is a published novelist. He'd worked for trauma in the 90s he'd worked his way up writing studio movies and he'd shown through his independent work that he he's not he's no colin trevorrow who makes safety not guaranteed that mark duplass says he basically directed and then gets a jurassic world this is somebody who worked in the industry for a long time before they were given a marvel movie and the yeah. reason james gunn was hired was because of his sensibility remember he's an auteur he wrote and directed those movies i mean Yes, he came in and rewrote a script for the first Guardians, but he was uh, a person that worked. He understood how to work within the studio system because he'd already been doing it as a writer. And Which then he why gone, I'm so excited about Superman. All those that, me too. I mean, I, I have I'm deliriously excited for Superman. Yeah, same. I, I've never been this much this hyped in, because in I years. think people don't quite understand, and, and, and admittedly so. But what's really interesting to me is here's what I don't understand about what's happening at Disney in particular. They've acquired Fox, and they've really done nothing with it. Do you know since Disney, aside from James Cameron's movies, the entire Fox library in the five years that Disney has owned Fox, they've made one 4K transfer off Fox's entire library? One. I can't say what it is, but you'd be like, wait, what? I don't understand this. This year... 20th Century Studios has coming out theatrically beginning in April, the first Omen in May, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, and in August, Alien Romulus. And we've seen Prey. They're doing Prey 2. 20th Century Studios is very quietly mining the entire 20th Century catalog. They have three theatrical franchise pictures coming out in the next five months. And... Deadpool and Wolverine, which comes out in July, is a de facto Fox film. Right. So the entire 2024 summer movie season is dominated not by Disney product, but by Fox product. Mm -hmm. And what did Disney do this oh. week? Disney replaced, they hired the guy at Searchlight and put him above Steve Asbell, who's been who, the president of 20th Century Studios, who's quietly making prey and now the new quietly made hellraiser doing all this stuff for hulu i mean fox has been doing all these things and disney has barely acknowledged that 20th century studios has been i mean kingdom of the planet of the apes looks pretty good alien romulus bio reports is supposed to be also very good uh the first omen i don't know if it's going to be great but as a respect as a horror film horror has been doing well in the marketplace the the movie with Miss Deaver that I forget the name of it that came out that's on Hulu is pretty good. Why isn't Steve Asbell being put front and center to control their franchises? He's very good friends with Kevin Feige. I mean, he's got their entire summer slate. He worked on, he was, he's been at Fox for 25 years. He's president of the studio and Disney put somebody over him this week. That's, that's so, that's, oh, uh, so yeah, what Rob, the fuck was that yeah. about? Rob, I hate to, in this Sorry. Uh, wonderful analysis, but we got to get uh, going here uh, uh, because uh, we're out of time. Uh, we had a lot to talk about today, and we talked about. It. I want to thank everyone in the chat for being here with us. Uh, Odin, any final thoughts, and where can people find more of you? Yeah, final thoughts is just I can't believe how how different Disney 
has has become how how Marvel much how much Marvel has changed. If you think about it, originally, it was those movies you went to and you could go to it whether you were a comic fan or whether you were just a normie audience. I'm a part of that normie audience. I didn't you know I wasn't raised with comics, and so I would go see those movies, and then my friends would say, "Oh, this is this person, and that means they're probably going to do this, and they're probably going to do that." And it was exciting because you're like, even though you don't know all the source material, you didn't need to because they gave you just enough to understand what was going on, and then they gave the comic fans enough to be like excited and to start speculating and everything like that. And now what's going on is now they're forcing fans, forcing people to watch garbage content and also have to do homework in addition to that, right? It's just amazing how that dynamic has changed. But you can find me over at OMB Reviews uh, on Odyssey, Rumble, YouTube, also on Twitter as well. Also, please make sure you vote in the Raven Awards because we do an Oscars boycott show because the Oscars have been bad for a very long time. So make sure to vote in that. It's posted on all the different social platforms. Thank you as always for having me. And Tom Connor Jr., uh, we got uh, Mead Radio coming up. Uh, we put a link in the chat for those of you who want to check that out. Do you have any final thoughts on where can people find more of you? No, it's just always fun to get to hang out with you guys on Saturdays. It's always an extra pleasure to get to hang out with the the man, the myth, the legend, Robert Meyer Burnett, of course. And, uh, yeah, just thank you for having me. As always, you can find me on Midnight's Edge, Midnight's Edge After Dark, and uh, going live on Mead Radio here shortly. Good stuff. Now, Robert Meyer Burnett, thank you so much for filling in last minute today. Well, thanks for uh, having and, me. And uh, you always have amazing insights into this stuff. Uh, where can people find more of you? And do you have any final thoughts? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett. Find me on uh, X at Burnett RM and uh, Robert Meyer Burnett on on Blue Sky and and what is that Threads? <laughs> but you can find me on YouTube at the Burnett Work, um, where I you know try and do industry analysis to the best of my ability. So find me there. I mean, here's look i i believe in entertainment and i think that with the coming i w won't call it threat of ai but ai is going to transform how we even think of entertainment and in ways that we can't even begin to imagine yet and i think more now than ever before we need great storytelling on a grand scale the way only the studios can give us and until they start being true to the stories that they're telling and really get behind the creators and figure out how they do what they do best, uh, we're going to be in a world of hurt, and so are they. But you know what? Even if it all falls apart, there are going to be new creators that rise up and take their place. And one of the things, I mean, I have to say, I didn't know this, but other YouTubers like Critical Drinker, uh, who's, who's, who's producing an adaptation of of a story he wrote he told us i didn't realize this that he's planning on putting his movie only up on his youtube channel oh. i find that fascinating i thought he was making a movie to be independently released in theaters but then i'm like he's got almost two million subscribers this is the future yeah. this is the future for independent filmmakers making your own that you own your own ip you you can control it and going directly to the consumer i think that is the future and it might take a while for people to make $200 million movies. But if $200 million movies aren't satisfying us and we can get independent creators that do, because independent filmmakers have always been a vital part of Hollywood, and I, I think that we do have a future. And Good great stuff. stories will come from many different places. And you know what? Maybe some of the people watching this show right now are going to be those people that are going to be creating things in the next decades that become the next huge ip well you speaking of know. great speaking of great creators brian from the popcast one of the most talented men i know <laughs> any final thoughts and where can people find more of you uh you can find me at uh, the popcast uh that's our main channel and we have a video coming out at the end of this week uh it's it's a it's another documentary it's a pretty long one um i can't say anything about it if you are if you're a member you probably know what know what it is um and I'm working on that right now. It's, I got like five more days of editing to do before that's up. But that's going to be awesome. And my live show every Monday and Thursday at 4 p.m. on uh, Pop Culture Unleashed. And that's our second channel. And it's fun. You should check it out. Oh, this this we're going to have JT back uh, this Monday. I'm sorry, not JT. Um, uh, Matt uh, Mr. Mr. Reagan. No, Mr. Reagan. Matt oh, Matt Fowler Reagan. is going to be on Thursday, oh. and we got Mr. Careful. Reagan on this Monday at four. My kid canceled. My kid canceled. I know. I, I was because I came with fire there. Brian. For, yeah, for one of the other guys, he's like, I was like, any topics you don't want to talk about? He goes, I don't. We can talk about whatever you want, but like, I'd rather talk about more entertainment stuff and less politics. I'm like, cool. 
And I, I was going to ask Chris the same thing, Mr. Reagan, he, and I already know the answer, so I'm not going to bother asking. <laughs> uh, Matt Vader, 74, yeah. any final thoughts before we get out of here? Um, No, not really. Just uh, another fun discussion where we have a lot of guys that have a lot of really good opinions, and I can sit back and just listen. I like those. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> Jesus, Forbes just dropped a bomb. Take it. Take the bomb. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we wanted to thank everyone who gave us super chats today. Uh, Gavin Blackburn, Doomed Huh, Late Night with Cap Podcast, JT Gunn, thank you so much. And Shorty Short came in with 199 Super Chat. Great stream today. Thank you, Shorty Short. We always appreciate you being here. But of course, not to be outdone by Scotty Dub. Uh, we got <laughs> William Forbes <laughs> dropping $120 wow, right nice. at the end of the stream. What's up, Scotty Dub? I saw your gauntlet and raised you on the Tuesday stream, and now here. Ball's in your court, bud. Can't watch live. I'm working. I'll catch the replay. Love you guys. Vader, you're still the favorite. Looking Thanks. forward to Vegas. Happy stream, y'all. Man, he just came in, dropped the bomb, and peaced out. How many That's feed it. picks did that cost you, Vader? I don't <laughs> I know. Question. I'm going to have to take some fresh ones. Try to take some new ones. Uh, but we want to thank everyone who donated to the stream today. William Forbes. <laughs> Very generous. Thank you so much for that. Also, uh, want to give a big shout out to see if I can uh, Samuel Schwager for gifting those five salty nerd uh, podcast memberships. Tune in on Tuesday because we go live at one p.m. Pacific, four p.m. Eastern every Tuesday for our main show. And of course, uh, be sure to tune in next week. I am not going to be here next week. Oh, Matt Vader is oh. going to be running the show, but we're going to have next <sighs> Iron Man helping with producing duties. Um, <laughs> no. but, we'll have Mike uh, here. It'll be okay. Brian's here. We're I'm gonna, here. we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna shake it up a little bit next week. I'm here, I'm queer, I'm ready I'm to party. I'm gonna have 14 <laughs> guests, and we're gonna talk about, and we're gonna talk about, uh, you know, lifetime yeah. movies, cats so. and dogs living together, <laughs> mass hysteria. It's gonna be but fantastic. It, it, yeah, it'll be fun. So, guys, thank you all so much for tuning in. I'm going to throw it to Alex to send us out uh, in style. And until next time, stay salty, my friends. Hey, folks, thanks so much for watching this live stream. If you want to watch our previous live stream, make sure to click right here. Or if you would like to check out one of our favorite highlights, click right here.